All right, fine. I'll make an actual video talking about my experiences with Quentin Reviews. Hello everyone, my name is Julia, known on the internet as Flower Gothic, and I edited Quentin Reviews' first two iCarly videos. I edited the majority of I Binged iCarly, and I was essentially the sole editor for the end of iCarly. While editing for him, I was overworked, underpaid, and I eventually realized that he never treated me as a friend, even though he called me one. Oh, and if you think I'm lying about that... Today, I want to talk about the year and a half I associated myself with Quentin, and how he ended up kind of fucking me over. Maybe that's an exaggeration. Fuck if I know. <laughs> I've talked about this before on social media, but some dear friends of mine encouraged me to make an official call-out video to get the word out, more in a way that's not me drunkenly yelling at people on Twitter. So let's do this. Our story starts in February 2020 with Garfield Eats. I half-jokingly made a story on my Instagram asking for Garfield Eats to come to Houston, which is my hometown and where I lived at the time. The Garfield Eats Instagram liked it, and I didn't think much of it until a couple of weeks later when I was added by Garfield Eats to a group chat where they were asking fans of the restaurant to invest in their expansion that ended up never happening. <laughs> One of the other people in that chat was Quentin. At this point, I knew of him, but I wasn't necessarily a fan. I knew he made that popular hashtag change the channel video and a couple of other things, but I never watched them. Or if I did, I don't remember. Oh, and if you're wondering, he gave Garfield Eats like a hundred bucks or something for their expansion. Eventually, Garfield Eats let their fanvestors, yes, that's what they really called us, have a Zoom meet and greet with Nathan Masri himself on April 20th. I went because I had nothing better to do, and lo and behold, Quentin was there too, wearing a fucking Garfield cap. Nathan Masri then confused me for strange aeons. No, really, he actually did that. Oh, you... Don't believe I was in that meeting? And that was the first genuine interaction Quentin and I had? Well, let's look at his Garfield plush video. And it seemed like most of the people were there to troll him or put him on the spot. There I am! That's me! That's me trying to process everything that's being said in the chat! I posted about it on Twitter and Quentin liked and retweeted a bit of it. I think I followed him at that point, I don't remember, it was certainly around that time, and that was that. Until a month and a half later, my friend Superdark was on Quentin's Discord server for a while, and they asked me if I wanted to be invited to it. I said, sure, why not, and I got in. Quentin immediately recognized my username and asked if we met before. I mentioned that I was on the Garfield Eats call and he remembered the whole strange aeons thing. Quentin and I would periodically talk, never in the DMs though, always in his server, and even took some of my suggestions, like showing video from Mr. Personality in his O.J. Simpson video, and to cut short the Madonna bit in his TikTok video because he fucking explained the joke in the original for the cut to the parody, WHO THE FUCK DOES THAT?! I'm sorry. I get really intense when there's a crime against comedy. But the biggest one was, perhaps, the title to his CN Real video. He had trouble thinking of one, as he wanted it to explicitly mention Cartoon Network 
and that it was about the CN Real block. I pitched Cartoon Network's failed live action block and, well, he followed me on Twitter after that video got released and I reminded him I pitched the title. Throughout the next few months, I managed to befriend Quentin. I got the coveted do not kick role in his Discord, made that masked Quentin edit he uses his Twitter profile for a bit, and I even befriended his biggest yes man, Hippie, and appeared on his channel in a since privated or deleted video. By the way, Hippie, if you're watching this, I hold no ill will against you. I just wish you haven't drunk the Kool-Aid, so to speak. Side note about Quentin's Discord. I've said it before and I wish I had receipts of this, but I sadly only have this. But Quentin kind of used his server as talk therapy. There would be times where he would just hop on and say, Hey, is anyone around? I'm feeling down and I want to talk to someone or something along the lines of that. And basically whoever happened to be on at the moment had to lift his spirits or whatever. Again, I sadly don't have any screenshots of those chats, so unless someone else leaks them, you're gonna have to take my word on it. Now, you may be thinking, wait a second, Flower, what about iCarly? Where's the iCarly editing story? We're about to get to it. I wanted to give a bit of a prelude before I talked about it. With everything I said on Twitter and TikTok, it's easy to believe that Quentin and I's association didn't begin until I started editing the iCarly videos. That's not true. And this was meant to show that we knew each other for a while beforehand. It has the added effect of me putting a bit too much trust in Quentin. Since I considered him a friend and he told me he considered me a friend, but let's get on with it. Again, I mostly addressed this in a Twitter thread, so if any of this sounds like rehashing, I do apologize. One month before I binged, I Carly dropped, things were moving super slow. Minimal progress, so to speak. Quentin had no real assets to work with, and if memory serves me right, he was just scratching the surface of season two. I remember Quentin having little done in mid-May because that was the same time I turned 21, which in America is a very significant birthday because that's when you can finally drink. So when Quentin was lamenting about looking for editors to get the video out before the iCarly revival, I volunteered myself. I spent eight hours of my May 16, 2021, editing Quentin's thoughts on the pilot, which was the tryout everyone who applied had to do. Here was Quentin's reaction. So yeah, I was hired like immediately. Was there a contract? No. Why didn't I ask for one? Two reasons. One, this was my very first real editing gig. I was fresh to the scene, as they say, and honestly, I had no clue that contracts were a necessity. Two, I had a major admiration for Quentin. I thought, hey, he's worked with people before. He knows the drill. I placed my trust in him. Now. During the majority of my time editing I Binged I Carly, I was in a three week, 15 day symposium for college where we made two short films. These classes lasted about four hours, not including an hour break for lunch. So I would wake up at 7 a.m., go to class at nine, stay there till like two or three and go home and edit I Carly until like nine or 10 p.m. Taking breaks, of course, were dinner and bathroom stuff, but only those two things. In total, I was working about seven hours a day on that iCarly video, along with school and my own content. And as I said before, I was the sole guest editor for seasons one and two. By the time season three 
was being edited, more editors joined and my workload reduced. Even then though, even then, Quentin credited me for saving the project. Payment was not discussed until after the video was released. Hell, I didn't even know how much I would get paid until the video dropped. He offered $2,000 of which PayPal took a cut. I know I took like two or three days off while editing, but all in all, I was working six or seven days a week on that mess. I didn't even know I was being underpaid until experienced editors pointed it out to me. Once the videos were out, videos. Once the video was out, Quentin worked on the Victorious video because he wanted his then long hair that he was planning to cut to be his style for that video for reasons I don't quite remember. And I worked on my own content. But even then, I still watched Victorious along with him and Hippie. I gave him notes and everything. Hell, two of the jokes in the Victorious video were from my notes. You could argue that Rex and Robbie are, in a way, a representation of the Freud psychoanalytic theory, which posits that there are numerous different aspects of our personalities which we strive to strike a balance between. Transpires that Cat has used a parody of Gorilla Glue for the adhesive, meaning the makeup is stuck to Tori's face, and also that the writers predicted Gorilla Glue Girl. And he gave me and Hippie special thanks in the original end for the first Victorious video. Also, did you know that the Victorious video was intended to only be one video? The entire iCarly video essay series was meant to only be like six videos. Two for iCarly, one for Victorious, one for Sam and Cat, one for all of Dan Schneider's fuckery, and one for the reboot. Now he's six videos in and he hasn't even finished Sam and Cat. Think about that. One more thing before I discuss End of iCarly. If you saw my Duggar video, you would know that my travel companion got really sick while we were in Arkansas and I had to take them to urgent care. Throughout the entire trip, I periodically messaged Quentin about it, especially since I was originally going to go for the Josh Duggar trial. He seemed very passive. And he was one of the first people I talked to once I got back. I sent a message about how much of a clusterfuck the trip turned out to be. I finally found the message. I'm not going to show all of it to respect the pronouns of my travel buddy, as well as his response. Once Quinn switched gears to iCarly Part 2, I, for some reason, ended up being the only editor hired for it. I was the sole editing credit. Now, I kept in mind video one's four week turnaround time and the fact that summer was coming to an end. I made it clear to Quinn that my availability was limited and that there would come a point where I had to return to school for my final semester. I even showed him my calendar. One additional class was added to that calendar for Mondays and Wednesdays after that, and there was one do-at-your-own-pace class that was entirely online and thus not on the calendar. And instead of showing respect for my time, he would take forever to send me the assets. It left me on the edge, constantly on my toes throughout August and September. And remember, I was the sole editor. There were times I had to beg him for the fucking assets for me to do my job. I even exp expressed my grievances via message. Quentin's response was along the lines of, I hear you, but he didn't address anything I said. So editing part two was hell to say the least. I worked six or seven hours a day on that video over the span of a little over a month to the point where I had to skip class from time to time to get the video done. I 
wanted it to succeed. I felt like, well, the video was my child. I was super attached to it, which to be fair is something I also experience when working on my own content. September 2021, End of iCarly comes out. Guess how much Quinn offered? $1,300. I asked for $1,700 and he sent it. When I called him out originally, I wanted to highlight this part the most, that he paid me less for doing more. I binged iCarly may have been longer, but as I said, by season three, two more people were added, so I ended up doing less overall for that video than I did for End of iCarly. <sighs> PayPal took their cut and I was left feeling listless, weary, like something was wrong, but I couldn't put my finger on it. Quinn still called me his friend. I still gave him notes for Victorious, but I felt like everything was one-sided, that I was giving way more than I was receiving. And then in November, our friendship fell apart. The final nail in the coffin is still something I'll keep near and dear to my heart, but it was my final message to him. I wrote it in notes because I wanted my friends to look over it before I sent it. He then gave me a half-assed apology. A friend of mine then chewed him out in DMs with my permission and I got booted from his server. And that was that. I spent four goddamn months in silence afterwards, hoping for some kind of apology from him. But instead, he self-plucked me on Twitter on New Year's Eve. Part of me thinks he knows he fucked up, but wants to run away from his problems instead of, you know, actually addressing them. I've spent a long time trying to make this more well-known. And, well, it's finally on YouTube, so God knows what will happen. Right now, I don't think Quentin wants to continue the iCarly videos. I think he's just chasing a high. His iCarly videos are super successful, so he feels obligated to make these super long meandering works, each one longer than the last, in hopes he can reach those millions of views again. That he can finally get that coveted one millionth subscriber. And hey, maybe I'm being petty, but even two years later, I'm still pissed off at him for what he did. And besides, I know he hasn't changed as a boss, but that's someone else's story to tell. I know that he was indeed creepy to Sarah Zed and Lindsay Ellis in Twitter DMs. I know the contents of those DMs, but that's someone else's story to tell. What happened to me isn't Quinn's only sin. For all I know, it could just be the beginning. Share this to the people you know, and let's find out. After all, things are seldom what they seem. Non sempre e sunt quae